Okay, so let's go. Well, everybody, uh, my name's Dave Pegler. Um, I'm an AI, uh, FCD. I've been diving since the early 90s, I think, sort of 15, 1600 dives. Um, so, yeah, that's, that, that's a little bit about me. And tonight I've been asked to uh, give you a lesson on launch and recovering uh, a club rib. So what I'm concentrating on tonight is typical sort of club rib, um, and that's uh, 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 with a V'd hull and uh, V-shaped roller uh, trailers. Um, so yeah, let's let's get into it. So what are we going to look at? Right, right. go. Ah, we're off. Right, so we're going to look at trailers, um, and I'm going to start off with some cautions and some good design points for trailers. Then we're going to look at a club uh, rib checklist. I'm, and something you'll, you'll learn from me as we go through this. I'm, I'm quite a fan of checklists and procedures, so you don't forget anything. So we're going to look at a club rib checklist. Um, once you've got the rib uh, hooked onto the uh, onto the onto the, the vehicle. There's simple checks that you can do just to make sure that you've got it hitched up properly. We're going to talk about the trailers and the law, and there's quite a lot on the government website which uh, gives you the legal requirements uh, for trailering. Planning ahead, so we can have a little think about um, what we need to do before we get to uh, the slipway. There's some things that we need to think about, tides, uh, when we can, when we can't recover the boat. Then finally, we're going to get to the launching steps, the recovery steps, and then the actions that we take post-recovery. Uh, post At the end of all of that, I'm going to take a little bit of a diversion into risk assessment. And if your club doesn't have a risk assessment for launching and recovering and trailering, and if it doesn't have a procedure, uh, launch and recovery then this is some little bits of guidance here that will help your club establish that and then finally no good lesson finishes without a little bit more work to do a couple of pointers to, to some further study that you can do so first off uh trailer cautions and there's a little bit of a shout out here to uh, bob elliott and that's quality time training uh, it's a bsac center down in portland so Bob gave me this information that's on the slide here. So if you are lucky enough to buy yourself a new boat and it comes with a nice shiny new trailer, often that trailer, unless you specify it right up front, that trailer could be, I'm saying could be, could be designed for just the dry weight of the rib. Now, of course, we're divers. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna fill that rib with fuel we're going to fill it full of shot weights, ropes, dive kit. We could easily add three, four, five hundred kilos to the weight of that rib trailer before we put it on the road. So if you are in a position that you're buying a new trailer, please make sure that you specify the weight of the trailer plus a little bit. All right. So some design issues again, just to help you with that. Most of the weight, or a lot of the weight, on a rib is right at the stern. It's exactly where it shouldn't be, but of course that's where we hang the great big engine. Um, so, because the engine's at the rear like that, there should be one set of rollers just inside the uh, just inside the transom to take the weight of that engine. The bow is supported up front on the winch post, and a final little one here. Something like 25 to 50 kilos of weight, sort of negative on the hitch. So the, it should be pushing the back of the uh, truck down. Now, that's a guideline. And there's some other advice out there uh, which says between 50 and 100 kilos. And it does depend on the size of the rib, the size of the engine, the size of the vehicle pulling it. So there are some different guidelines there. But certainly you want between 25 and 50 is a, is, a, is a first guideline. Okay, so I'd like to see, and I'm sure a lot of you have done this, the alarm went off at something like half past four. It's now five o'clock in the morning or half past five. 
and you're the first one to arrive at the boat shed. So it's your job to uh, to get the rib checked. So what do you do? Use a checklist. Um, and there's lots of reasons for this. So it helps with the memory, all right? It helps you to familiarize yourself with the boat. It could have been, what, three, four weeks since the last time you were there looking at the boat. I mean, we're all in lockdown now. We're going to be in lockdown for another four or five weeks, perhaps. So a lot of us won't have looked at the rib for nearly 10 weeks. So it's a good way to get yourself familiar again with the boat. It facilitates self-help because it helps you remember to bring everything that you need. And in an emergency, you'll know where it is and you've got it all. Don't forget that when you do in the checklist, don't forget to include the vehicle itself. Vehicle maintain the oil level, uh, level uh, check the radiator if we still do that, um, etc. So it's worth having some vehicle checklists in there as well. Little shout out here for all the boat officers out there. I was one for years. There's lots of unsung club heroes out there that spend hours and hours making sure the boats are serviced and, and of course, repairing everything that we broke last time we took the boat out. But regular servicing is important, and that includes the boat engines, the hydraulics. Um, of course, the trailer needs regular maintenance. And of course, don't forget the towing vehicle needs regular maintenance. So then finally, you make it and you've got the uh, the club truck and you've got it reversed and you've hitched it up to the back of the trailer. So there's a few little checks that we need to go through now. Now, when you put the when you when the trailer hitch goes on to the ball on the back of the vehicle, it should make a lovely click. It should it should kind of clonk home nicely. But how do you know you've actually got it now? Uh, sometimes it can, from experience, the the, the um, assembly can kind of get halfway down the ball. Um, it's actually not actually just just digressing there. It's actually a good idea to get a little bit of um, uh, brake cleaner and just clean any loose rust off, and certainly all the oil and grease if there is any off the ball of the trailer. But one of the ways to actually check that you've actually got this clicked home is because you've still got the jockey wheel there, just give the jockey wheel a wind down and just to see if it starts to raise the back of the vehicle. If it doesn't, of course, and it pops straight off, then you know you've got to do it again. So what's next? We fit the breakaway cable, so that's just the cable. God forbid we lose the trailer. Uh, the electrical cable then has to be connected. Raise the jockey wheel and lock it off. Next thing is we attach the light board and registration plate. And at this point, it's a it's a must is to make sure that that light board is working. So indicators, brakes, reverse light. Let's just make sure that that light board is working. Release the trailer handbrake. <laughs> There's been lots of times we've forgotten to do that. I've certainly forgotten to do that. Um, other part of checks to be done is the tire pressure and tread, just like you would with your own car. But of course, again, it's going to be 10 weeks by the time, hopefully, by the time we get back to this rib. Just make sure that you've got um, the reasonable pressure in your trailer tires. If they've gone soft, they'll get hot and then they're susceptible to, uh, to part in company. Okay, the engines. Now, uh, we raise the engines a little bit, and that's to protect the skeg from um, any uh, speed bumps that we might go over. If you've got a modern engine, the uh, manufacturers state that you can actually transport the engine in any sort of orientation up, and it doesn't matter, and it's okay on the hydraulics. Uh, engines, if you elevate them all the way up, they have a little mechanical arm that comes down. Um, but some of the older engines actually need you to just lift it up a little bit and then you put a rubber block underneath it just to chock it off or even a wooden board and tie that off uh, for transportation. The takeaway there is speak is to is to read the manufacturer's uh, manuals for the engine that you've got on the back of your rib. The final thing to do is to cover the uh, propeller. And then if you just put it into gear, it'll stop it running. Okay, so I'm gonna take a little digression here. 
into trailers and the law. So what does your driving license allow you to do? So typically, 2.55 meters wide by seven meters long. You must have towing wing mirrors, or as, as, as we call them when we tow the caravan, the little ears on the side of the vehicle. So you need those little extensions out there. And finally, if it's over a combined weight of 750 kilos, you need a braked trailer. So how do you know how heavy your trailer is? Well, one of the ways to do that is actually to take it out, put it on a weigh bridge and weigh it. Now that's not the end of it. There's some restrictions on when you pass your test. If you've got gray hair like me and you pass your test in the early eighties, you're allowed to tow a combined weight of up to 8.25 tons. So we get a bit of a pass out. But if you pass your test after 97, there are some increased restrictions. The trailer weight must not be greater than 750 kilos, combined weight. So, sorry, that's combined, that's trailer and, and rib. But the combined weight of the trailer is three tons. Now, that's not a lot. Modern vehicles are much heavier than they used to be. The, 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 the mass of vehicles has increased dramatically since the early 90s, all the airbags and, and, and crash steel that's in the doors, cars are much heavier. Um, so if your trailer's heavier than 750 kilo, there's a separate test required, all right? Okay, traders in the law, a little bit more. We just push on. So you're restricted to 50 or 60 miles an hour. So on dual carriageways, A roads, it's 50, motorways, 60. Third lane restriction, in other words, you're restricted to the inside two lanes on a motorway. Tires have to be legal, just the same as they do on your car. Uh, lights and number plates all have to be working. And then when a good friend of mine uh, proofread this, she said, make sure you tell them that the number plates have to match. So I put a little note there. So it is very easy that you've got, that you normally tow with one vehicle and somebody else turns, oh, I've got a tow hitch, I'll come down and tow it. Well, make sure they bring their spare number plate as well. And of course, insurance. You need insurance for both the car and the trailer. There is a lot of good advice on the UK uh, website. And the link to it is shown you there. Okay, now plan ahead. So what I've shown there is a little photograph of Porth Pembrokeshire. Now, state of tide, if you can read that description on the bottom there, it says access two hours either side of high water. And you can quite clearly see the slipway goes down there, uh, makes a, as we can see there, makes a left turn. You can see the boats there stranded at low tide. So it's if you're going to come, if you're going to dive out of Porthgain, you really need to do a little bit of homework around tide times, when you can launch, when you can recover. So where can you go to check that? There's one or two places, uh, boatlaunch.co.uk, which is where that description came from. The Reeds Almanac or even call the Harbour Master would be good sources of information. Trailer parking. So you've got down there, you've launched your rib. Now what do you do with your trailer? What are the local rules? What are the local procedures? Where do you park? Is there dedicated parking? Of course, we always have to pay in this day and age, but how much is it? How do you pay? It's all part of that planning process. And finally, a lot of insurance trailer will want you to have both a wheel clamp and a hitch lock. So it's worth understanding what your insurance uh, limitations are. Finally, we're now looking at launching a rib, which is what you all came here for. So the first thing, and I said this right, I like the, the uh, risk assessments the, and the written procedures, the checklists. So have yourself a written uh, procedure and, and, and safety brief. So everybody knows what their roles are and what they're required to do. So there we are, some guys getting ready to... Uh... So typically there's three key people involved. It's the driver of the vehicle, 
it's the cox on the boat, and then it's a lookout that's actually in charge, in charge of this whole operation, is the lookout. He's the one that's walking all the way around the vehicle, looking, communicating the driver. Everybody else essentially stays clear. But before we, the next step, before you actually launch this, you prep the boat for launch. So that's load all the dive kit on board. Uh, the elephant's trunks may need bringing up into position. Depends on the size of the rib. We used to have an old an old rib years ago that had a hull drain, drain plug. And uh, we did go out once without pulling that in. And we emptied about, I don't know, 500 litres of water out when we pulled it out the slip. Uh, remove the light board and registration. Some new trailers come with submersible lights, but you might have the old one where you remove the light board with a reg plate on it. Um, boat electrics on, uh, engine key and kill cord all in place. And of course, you've checked the electrics because you did your rib checklist when you picked it up and you've made sure you've got the key and the kill cord. That was all done at five o'clock in the morning. Engine shocks removed, untie the painter, uh, coil the painter and put it to and keep it in hand. It's typically down by the side of the driving console. Um, the the rib itself may be strapped down, so again you've got to un unstrap the rib. Uh, release the winch hook, and off we go. So, reverse the boat trailer into the water. The lookout communicates with the cox and the driver. Four by four, uh, low ratio is going to give you better control as you move that vehicle down into the water. Typically, about halfway up the trailer wheel is about the right place. I mean, I remember years ago we used to back. I used to back this old Land Cruiser I had. I used to back it until the exhaust was bubbling, but maybe we didn't need to do that now. Right, lower the engine into the water. Make sure the engine water intakes are underwater. So we're looking for that little telltale. Uh, kill cord attached, start the engine. So we're looking for that little telltale that we, that we know that the engine cooling system's working. Release the winch hook. Reverse the boat off the trailer. So that's it, we've now got a rib in the water. So the next step is to motor over to the pontoon and moor up. So just a little digression here. Um, another great source of information is the RYA website. And there was an interesting thing I picked up on that. It suggested that you wait 45 minutes between arriving at the slip. So you've towed it down the motorway, you've arrived at the slip. It suggests you wait 45 minutes before you back it into the water. And that's to give the bearings time to cool down because if they're hot, um, they could actually create a, a, a bit of a vacuum and then pull salt water into the bearings. Um, but typically, we arrive and then we're waiting for everybody else to arrive. So there's an hour uh, before we actually launch, anyway, as we load the uh, as we load the boat. Okay, um, so sorry, digress there. Um, so motor over to the pontoon and more up. Typically, a club member's ready to assist on the pontoon. So we've had a lovely day out. We've been diving. And uh, of course, we're, uh, we're now back and we've got to put the rib back on the trailer. So how do we do that? Well, it's a typical, straightforward reverse of what we did before, reverse of the launch. So we start with the safety briefing, the same three key people, driver, cox, and lookout. We might need just one or two people in the water just to help guide the boat onto uh, onto the trailer. Now, I know there's one or two people out there watching tonight that have launched and recovered ribs on their own without even getting their toes wet, but that's uh, that's quite a skill and quite an art to uh, 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 to perfect that. So what I'm going through here is a very typical club launch and recovery procedure. Everybody else needs to stay clear. So prep the boat for recovery, get it tidy, get the painter ready. Uh, where are the, the car keys? Um, we've got to remove the uh, uh, the wheel lock and the locks all got to be removed. Have we got the keys for that? Right, typically off to a pontoon, drop the divers off. Cox and perhaps an assistant stays on the boat. 
Car and trailer need to be made ready. And we just talked about that. Winch handle, have we got that to hand? Again, you check that five o'clock in the morning. Painter ready, coiled, keep to hand. Right, here we go. So drive the boat onto the, so we've reversed the boat down, we've reversed the trailer uh, down the slipway. And so about halfway up the trailer wheels. Drive the boat onto the trailer. So wind direction, which way is the wind direction going? Um, and nice and steady, nice and slow as you drive it onto the, as you drive it onto the trailer. You might need just one or two people being very cautious in the water just to guide that bow and just to line it up onto the onto the the, uh, the rollers. In fact, the modern rollers, the way they articulate, they will actually guide the guide the hull onto the trailer. Right, so attach the winch, start to winch the boat up. Uh, engine off, elevate the engine. Once we've got the rib all the way up onto the uh, onto the trailer, all the way up to the uh, the winch arm, we can tie the painter off. Once that's done, we're now ready to drive the boat up the slipway. So again, four by four low ratio is good. Um, so a question, can you launch and recover a boat with a two wheel drive? Um, the answer to that, of course, I'm an engineer. So the answer to that does, it depends. Um, so there's some pros and cons. If it's a fairly small light rib, the answer is yes. Um, if it's a rear wheel drive vehicle, there's a little bit of caution here because um, the bottom of, if it's low tide, the bottom of the slipway could be quite slippery and you're only in two wheel drive. Fortunately, that weight on the hitch will push the back wall traction but if you've got a front wheel drive which a lot of modern vehicles are you've got the reverse problem you've now got the trailer pushing the rear of the vehicle down which is lifting the front of the car which is taking traction away from the front wheels so the answer is yes you can but it depends four by four is the way to go um, look out communicating with the cox and driver as that boat comes up the slipway drain hull can be removed drain so if you drain the hull, the plug can be removed. Um, unload the dive kit. Typically, once we're at the top of the slipway, clear the slipway, let other people use it. Electrics off. Stow the key and kill cord. Attach the light board registration plate. Again, confirm that the, uh, the lights are working. Uh, we talked about the elevating the engine and just putting the chocks under there. And finally, we're, uh, we're putting the, the propeller cover, putting it back into gear, and then we're strapping the boat back down onto the trailer, ready for transport. Post-dive actions. So the boat and trailer needs to be washed down. We talked about washing down the, um, certainly washing down the, uh, the bearings on the, uh, on, on the trailer. So we wash the boat down. The engines are typically flushed. I've just highlighted the little tailpipe there where we connect the hose pipe. Just give the engines a good flush through. Some places you might see they actually have a great big bin of water and they lower the engine into the into a great big bin and actually run the engine. Um, so that flushes out all the lower leg and the, uh, um, and the middle leg and the impeller. Um, so wash the axle, the trailers and axles. If you can, it's best done before you go home. In fact, if there's a hose at the top of the slip, that's a great time to wash it down. It's also a good time to wash all the dry suits, and you might even splash a bit of water on your kit as well. Make it uh, save yourself a bit of time when you get home. Fit the instrument covers. Again, uh, this friend of ours, that when she checked this, she said, make sure to tell them that you fit the instrument covers when you get home. Otherwise, you'll leave them on the a 1st <laughs> so the instrument covers on that very expensive Garmin that you just bought. So it's often a good idea not to fit those until you get home. Um, and then finally, we put the boat to bed with a cover over the top. Lastly, um, you now need to report to that uh, club member, the, uh, the boats officer, that hardworking guy in the background, and tell him all the things that you've broken on the boat. So that's important. So it's ready for, the, so it's ready for you next time you want to go out. So that's launching, recovering, and some post-dive actions. But we're not quite finished. What I want to do is just take a little sidebar now onto risk assessments. So I'd like you to think for a moment, what risks do we actually have? 
So the winch handle, there's a lot of tension on that strap or cable as you winch that boat up. If you let go of it, that handle will spin extremely fast. There's also some nasty pinch points in the gears there. There's pinch points with the rollers, with your fingers as you're guiding that boat. The trailer's got wheels, the, the, uh, the truck's got wheels. Don't get your feet underneath that. Don't get your legs underneath it. Don't get caught between the, don't let yourself get caught between the trailer and the car. I have seen a car and boat slip a little bit on the, uh, on the slipway as they come up because, because of the green uh, seaweed at the bottom of the, uh, bottom of the slipway. Um, other boat traffic. So be aware, look around you uh, as you bring the boat onto the trailer. If you get waked as you put it onto the trailer, it can be, it can cause injuries. The propeller, the danger of the propeller needs no introduction. Um, wind and waves can cause you a problem. And finally, public, children, they all need to be kept away. Just going to read out now some real life incidents um, that have happened to club members over the years. And some of these are as serious as it can get. Okay, so there was a trailer tipped over. Um, it was pulled up the slipway, complete with all the divers on board. There was an upturn at the top of the slipway. I don't know exactly what happened, but I suspect what happened was they threw the trailer wheel off the edge of the slipway and the boat and trailer tipped over. So you can imagine the injuries that were caused there. Um, there was a, an incident where the boat was being recovered with a tractor. You can, you, can, uh, you can see the situation. You've been out diving, it's been a wonderful day. You've got it back on the trailer. You're all riding back, hanging on the tractor. The next step is wash the boat down out of the dry suits and straight into the pub. You can see everybody's happy. The tractor's maybe going, I don't know, half a mile an hour too fast, over a bump. Somebody fell over and got crushed and was, 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 was fatally injured under the trailer. I mentioned the winch handle. Um, there's an incident where somebody was actually struck in the face and blinded in one eye. Um, I talked about waves earlier. There was an incident where waves, they were trying to recover. It was, uh, it was uh, they were in deep water. There was waves and they ended up with a lacerated finger. You might recall right at the start, I talked about regular servicing, um, regular checks on the boat. There was a battery explosion, um, fire, followed by a non-working fire extinguisher. Um, and there was a facial injury caused by that one. So there are real uh, risks and there have been real accidents and serious injuries as, as fatality uh, launching and recovery. So what can we do about this? So I think the first thing we can do is run a risk assessment. So it's a written procedure. Um, if you've never run one of these before within the club, I can point you to the BSAC website. Um, I put together a, uh, uh, a little online lesson of how to use the BSAC risk assessment um, form procedure. And that's on the web. It's just a little video that's three minutes. It will sort of guide you through how to use that. But if you run a risk assessment and you write yourself a little procedure to give people the different roles and responsibilities, that will help you mitigate and control the risks. Assign tasks and roles. And I think this is really clear because I, I suspect some of you might have been screaming at me throughout this that that's not the way you do it in your club. Um, so when you do write your club procedure, it needs to be specific to the car, the rib, the trailer, how you communicate within the within the club. What 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 I, I said, driver Cox, look out. I mean, what what communication do you have uh, within your own club? Um, and site specific can also there's, there's there's some different cautions there. I just mentioned one where there was a tight turn at the top. So it's if you get a sort of generic club procedure, you're 80, 90 percent of the way there. And then when you get to a particular site, you can do it. I would say a dynamic risk assessment, and if there's any small changes need to be made, you've got a framework to, uh, to work from. Um, just a couple of words of warning here. Beware of the new keen member. You can turn up, you'd be very keen, 
wants to get stuck in, but doesn't know what to do. So let's look after those new guys. Maybe the first time they're out there, give them a job. Keep a lookout, keep all the kids away, and just watch, learn, see what we do, and then next time you can be involved. And, and this is a final, maybe a funny one from me. Um, complacency is the enemy of experience. It is very, very easy to uh, think, okay, I've done this a hundred times. I don't need to use my checklist. I don't need to use my procedure, et cetera. So complacency uh, can be the enemy, of it, the, the enemy of experience. And there is a, statistically, there is a, a bit of a spike in accidents when people have done the same job and are very competent and have done it for years and years. And unfortunately, it's that nasty word complacency. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we're nearly at the end. But no good lesson would finish without us suggesting that there's some further study required. So obviously the first thing to do is to get straight out there and do your boat handling course. And uh, us down here in the southern region, we can offer you that in, uh, in Portland at quality time. We run one of those just recently, just before Christmas. In fact, just before the, the, uh, the lockdowns, et cetera. So get yourself onto one of the boat handling courses. I'm going to point you again at the BSAC website. Um, there's a, a, a lovely little document. This is the Guidelines for Safe Operation of Members Club Boats. And this is put together by the Combined Diving Association. It's really quite a good read. Um, and it's, it's all the, all the uh, safety equipment guidelines that your boat should have. Uh, for safe diving. So from that, you could easily create, a, you know, a checklist, which you then apply to your own boat. So it's a really good document just to go and spend a few minutes with. Ladies and gentlemen, that was everything that I had to tell you. So what did we go through? We looked at trailers. I give you a couple of cautions and good design elements. So the takeaway there would be, if you buy a new ribbon trailer, make sure that the trailer's designed for uh, three, four hundred kilos, whatever you decide, extra on your uh, uh, on the weight of the uh, on the weight of the rib itself, just for the fuel and all the kit you're going to put on it when you trailer it. Uh, we turned up early in the morning uh, to get the boat ready. Use a checklist. Make sure you've got everything that you need for launch and recovery. Uh, the winch handle, the uh, keys, the, the electrics checked. So make sure you've got that checklist and use it. You've got the trailer hitched onto the back of the truck. There's a few checks that you need to do there. Make sure that the actual uh, 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 is, is, is fully clicked onto the, the, the hookup is fully clicked onto the tow hitch. Uh, breakaway cable, uh, checking that the lights are all working. Release the handbrake. I mentioned that, release the handbrake. Trailers in the law. Uh, we talked about that. So if you before 97, you get bit of a pass out uh, if you're after if you passed after 97 you've got a seven and a half ton sorry 750 kilo limit on your trailer otherwise you need to take a new test so you might have to get your trailer weighed plan ahead there are some uh, slipways where you're very restricted on the times of the tide that you can launch and recover we went through launching steps and recovery steps and the big thing there is to uh, to have a procedure, to have a quick safety brief, assign roles and responsibilities so everybody knows what they're doing. Post-dive action, so we wash the boat down, um, we load the boat, so we unload the boat, etc. So and make sure we're washing down the boat, flushing the engines out, and washing the trailer down, and especially the, uh, the bearings and the axle. And I finished off with a risk assessment. Um, so if your club doesn't have uh, hasn't done a risk assessment for launching recovering. I, I do suggest you do one, and I suggest you put a very simple um, uh, procedure together for launch and recovery. I gave you my email at the start. My email is on the very on the next slide. So if you if you email me, I'm happy to give you the pro sort of generic procedure that we've written. And finally, I suggested some further study, which would be get yourself onto the boat handling course. And, uh, and have a look at that guide that's on the BSOC website. So thank you for spending your evening with me. It's been appreciated. So final little shout out to Streets of Aqua Club for helping me with all the photographs. Um, and to John and Kathy Delara Newbury, who uh, provided a lot of photos and some proofreading. And Fran from Plymouth Sound.
uh, for helping. So that's it. Thank you very much.